Where's Charlie been? He's Charlie! right here. Even when the team doesn't show up, Charlie O'Connor, Philadelphia's number one hockey beat reporter, certainly does. Yay. And Chuck, if you just heard me going on about Joel Faraby, feel free to comment. But first and foremost, the fuck happened tonight? Yeah, th they just play terrible. I mean, that's really what it boils down to. Uh, John Torrell, after the game, called it a drubbing. He said that, you know, the first three games of this week, and even including the Montreal game, he didn't think the team played all that bad. You know, I, I agree that the Florida game, I think that was that was a goalie. That, that was the goalie problem. The Rangers game was one that could have went either way. Would have probably preferred a, uh, a different tactic in the three-on-three, -three, but... I agree. Game could have went either way. And the Montreal game, I think they, they got enough chances that they could have won that game. They didn't because they didn't finish. And because for the first half of the game, their offense was non-existent. But on the whole, they could have won that game. This was not a game where you could watch and say they could have won this game. They played like dog shit yep. against the second worst team in hockey. And one thing that was, I would say, the most interesting part of the post game. Because after, after the Montreal game, John Tortorella offered this up essentially without prompting that he thinks the team is a bit tired. So we asked him kind of, was this part of that too? And he's like, look, more or less, yes. Like he was pretty open about his belief that he said in particular, and I 100% I agree with this especially. He's like, Sanheim and York are running on fumes right now. And especially Sanheim looks like he's running on games right now we interviewed Sanheim after the game and you know he didn't deny that like he's kind of out of gas I mean they've been riding those two defensemen hard because of all this defenseman injuries they, they've been getting over 25 minutes a night pretty much every night they look dead tired the t like Arison doesn't look like he's mentally sharp at the moment the team as a whole they're just roll they're throwing guys out there who just don't look like they're it's not that they're that they're exhausted in the sense that they can't do anything but the passes aren't crisp. You know, the back checking isn't quite as fierce. And the, the, the want is there. I think they want to do things. It's not like they're not trying. It's just that when you're tired, everything becomes a little bit harder. And the, I point to the, the power play goal that, that Chicago scored. The, uh, where they, they had three quick passes, one right after another after another. And the only way you can execute a play like that is if all three passes are perfect because the guys can immediately pass right after. I don't think they've had a sequence of passes like that in the last two games no. at any time. No. Nothing has been crisp. Nothing has been sharp. And some of that's execution, absolutely. But I have to believe that some of that is fatigue because everything's just harder to do quickly and efficiently when you're tired. And I think these guys are tired. The problem is, is that like they will get the three-day break next week. And I think that will help. But they got one more game coming on Monday, a pretty big game. Like the Islanders probably aren't going to be part of this. But like they're still hanging around because the Flyers keep losing. And if, if you give them two points, suddenly the Islanders might be back in this thing. So it's a pretty big game. Mm -hmm. The Flyers need to find some way to get their energy back, to do just a hard reset you know, find a way. I don't care if you get 10 shots on goal. Find a way to win that game because it does feel like this might be slipping away. Charlie, I get that they're tired. We've been through the schedule 15 games in 30 days. They haven't had more than one game, you know, uh, one day between games and two weeks, all this stuff. I get it. They play a style that's up tempo and exhausting. We're 70 plus games into an NHL season, though. Like, isn't everyone tired? Isn't everyone banged yeah. up and exhausted? Like, I, I understand, but listen, maybe this is all just part of it. Now they know what it's going to take to finish off a run like this, but you think it's going to get easier in the playoffs? I, I don't know. It, it just seems no. like while it might be valid, I don't know. I think 31 other teams have the exact same excuse, including a team tonight that is playing for fucking nothing. They're probably not They tired. stink. Like... Shouldn't they just be mailing it in? Because, like, hey, who cares? No, they came out and kicked the Flyers' ass. Like, how is this a valid excuse? Well, I, I don't think, like, I, I don't love the term excuse because I think this is just what's happened. Like, I just think they are the tired. Now, does, does that mean that every every other team you know doesn't deal with fatigue this time of year? Yeah, I mean, it's true. Like, I can't remember if it was Torts or if it was Sanheim who more or less said that. Like, look, everybody's tired this time of year, so we can't use it as an excuse. But I do think that 
for multiple reasons. Number one, the style they play. Number two, the injuries on the back end. Number three, there's some key guys, like perfect example being one of the guys you were talking about when I came into the show and I was waiting to get rolled in, Sean Couturier. Like, that's a unique set of circumstances where not every team has a guy who's one of the three or four most important players on the team who missed a year and a half due to two back surgeries and now and then was given 20 minutes a night for the first two and a half months of the season. Like, that's a unique circumstance. So I do think, while I agree with you, that – Fatigue can't be used as like a catch-all excuse because everybody is tired this time of year. Everybody's banged up. The circumstances have presented themselves in a way where the Flyers probably have gotten hit by it harder. Now, again, some of this is is kind of on them. Like, they did not have to. I mean, I understand why they did it. They did not have to give Sean Couturier 20 minutes a night the first three months of the year. They did not have to play Cam York 30 minutes and Travis Sanheim 26, 27 minutes for a month. Like, they could have spread out the minutes more. Now, they might have lost more games, but maybe those guys wouldn't be absolutely gassed right now if they didn't. Like, there's reasonable points of disagreement here where you could say the coaches, the players, whatever. But the fact of the matter is is that this just looks like a tired team right now. And I was hoping that they would be able to just kind of deal with it because the teams they're playing aren't that good now. It's like, okay, well, they might be tired, but, like, even a tired Flyers team should be able to beat the Canadians and the Blackhawks. Well, apparently a tired Flyers team cannot beat the Canadians and the Blackhawks because they didn't. So now we're in this position where if they want to make the playoffs, they got to start winning some games. They're running out of time. The one thing that's saving them is that the teams chasing them aren't playing that well either. Yeah, no but one wants to win games. Think, like, you would think that at some point some of these teams are going to start winning. So the Flyers need to... I don't know how they're going to do it, but they're going to need to find some way to get energy because the games are going to keep going. One of the uh, one of the guys I'm looking towards right now is a young veteran, a guy who should be in you know the prime of his life. We haven't heard much about him being banged up. It's Joel Farabee. He has nine points in his last 27 games. He hasn't scored in seven games. He's minus 20. I, I realize you know. Not the best stat, but minus 20 in 27 games is pretty bad for one of your better players. Where the hell has he been? Two shots on goal tonight, minus two. Just kind of kind of not doing anything. Yeah, I, I thought he was one of the few guys. I mentioned this actually in my column uh, against the Rangers where, you know, when I was explaining kind of what could have happened, where they could have won this game, it was like, hey, maybe somebody like Joel Farabee, who was pretty much invisible all night, even as – you know, guys like Tippett and Frost and those guys are doing stuff. Farabee wasn't, just like Couturier wasn't. Yeah, they need more from Joel Farabee. You would think that a guy his age would have a little bit more energy right now. I don't know if he's gassed. He might not be gassed. He might just be struggling. Like, guys go through rough patches of the season. Maybe Farabee is not tired. Maybe Farabee is just not playing well. And that's on him. You know, guys got to play better. Like, I, I don't... I'm not going to be too hard on Sean Couturier because I understand that, like, I get why he's gassed. I think that makes perfect sense to me that given the workload he got the first half of the year, given the the layoff and everything, I understand why he is tired. Joel Farabee, I agree. He's he's a guy where, you know, he should be able to pick up the slack for a Couturier. He should be able to do it. He just hasn't, and it's a completely fair criticism. And, it, like, this is my complaint about what's going on with Sean Couturier right now. Like, I, I, this isn't about picking on singularly Joel Farabee or anyone. It's just, like, there's about three dudes on this team I think are warranted this ice time. And it seems like, okay, well, Couturier plays 11 minutes a night because, you know, we need more out of him and he's not giving it to us. Who are these guys right now that are giving it to them? Where are these players that are earning their ice time? Frost? Uh, Frost, Tippett, Forster, all right. TK, rough night, but he's TK. He's been their best player all year. Who are the rest of these guys earning anything right now? Well, I mean, if you ask John Tortorell, Brian Paling is definitely earning. Oh, my God. Don't get me started, Charles. Go. <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, yeah, look, and, and I don't think – I know that this seems really bad right now because they lost the freaking Blackhawks. I don't think this is quite – like – this is part of what happens when you have a daily show. Like, we have to talk about everything as if it's the most important fucking thing ever. But, like, 
four days ago, they had an incredibly exciting game against the Rangers, who are like the one seed in the Metro right now, and we're playing right with a really good team. Yes, the last two games have stunk. Yes, I think it's reasonable to be concerned that this team might just be out of gas and they might not be able to get it back. It's reasonable to be concerned, but like it wasn't that long ago when we were all feeling pretty good about this team. Things can change very quickly, as we've seen. The last three days have changed everybody's opinion about where the Flyers are. Maybe on Monday they go out and they win 4-2, and then they have three days off, and then they come out and they beat the crap out of two bad teams in a back-to-back next weekend, and suddenly they're looking real good again. So I'm not saying that the frustration and the criticism isn't valid, because it is, but I'm just saying that it might not be as bad as it seems right now just because we're coming off of one of the, if not the worst losses. I fully understand where you are coming from that, uh, coming from with that, Charlie, and you're right. Like, we do put things under a microscope that three days from now might not matter at all. But this is supposed to be the easiest stretch of the schedule. It is the most important stretch of the season. I'm just feeling like this thing is slipping away for reasons that are within their control. Like, this team got by with a great penalty kill all year. The penalty kill has gone to absolute friggin' shit. The the goaltending has just dried up entirely. They're not getting any goaltending. The scoring, no one scores anymore. Like, you score two goals against two bottom-feeding teams. That's bad. And the reason we're on board-ish with the plan not to tear this down, it's because we want to see these guys come through. We want to test them in these meaningful games. This doesn't seem like great culture building to me. Like, oh, yeah, well, we're just going to lay an egg when it matters most in winnable games, at home, bad team. Like, I, I just think the criticism is valid simply because the time of year it is and what the plan is. Like, the plan is to play these meaningful games and show these guys what it's about Uh, if they come up empty who are these guys then well i mean part of it too is that in theory because i mean there's a lot of ways you can spin ways you can spin this narrative you could say that well they're learning what it takes to succeed in these games and by failing they can then learn they can learn to be better in meaningful games in the future there's a lot of ways you can spin this narrative in the end the reason why we're spinning the narrative in a super negative way is because we're pissed off because the team lost a game they should have won, and you're mad. So because you're mad, you're going to position things in a way that feeds that frustration. And that's what's great about covering a team. That's what's great about being a fan. Like, that's part of it. I'm just saying that, like, let's see how this all plays out. I don't think they're, they're cooked. I don't think it is inevitable that this whole thing is now in the process of falling apart. I think it's concerning. And again, to me, the big thing is is that, like, if they just are out of gas, how are they going to replenish the tank when they have another big game in two days? Then they guess they have the break. And I guess maybe your, your hope is, is you, just maybe you, you get a win somehow on Monday, you get that break, then you have two games against teams that you should be. Now, granted, they just had two games against teams they should be, and they lost both of them. But, like, I don't think this is unsalvageable. They just have to find a way to salvage it, and I'm not going to bury this team until they actually definitely don't salvage it because they are still on a playoff spot. Like as, as frustrating as tonight is they, they're falling behind the Capitals to be sure the Capitals are going to pass them because they have a better points percentage. They are still on a playoff spot. This isn't over. They still don't have that difficult of a schedule the rest of the way. I'm just saying they can still salvage this. They are just in the mix. They are still in a spot. This isn't over. It's just concerning. Charlie, Sam Marison has uh, not been good. Do you think there's a chance we see, like, going into the back-to-back, we expect to see Ivan Fedotov next weekend. You think we could see him on Monday? It feels like that could be maybe one of those sparks, something they could do to try to wake this team up and get a little something extra out of them. Do you expect that to be a possibility? Well, I, I don't think they've made the decision one way or the other. The, the thing is, is that yet, you know, who knows? They might decide to go for their golf on, on Monday. It's possible. The big thing, and this is what Tortorella said today. I actually wasn't in Morning Skate because I was still going back to Montreal, but I watched the video. Tortorella basically said, look, like, I'm, I don't know shit about goalies, so I am just going to depend on what Kim Delaval tells me. And if Kim Delaval tells me 
Fedotov looks ready. He looks sharp. He, you know, he's he's kind of in the right mental state to take a game. Yeah, maybe they'll give it to him. And I tweeted this out last night that I actually think that there is a a decent chance that he starts out quite well, just because, you know, you see it with Arison. Like teams are starting to get a little bit of a look on Arison. Arison's going to have to adjust, whether that's this season or whether it's next season. He's going to have to make improvements to adjust. The teams are starting to learn his tendencies. Nobody knows Fedotov's tendencies, and he's also freaking huge. So, like, their teams are going teams are going to have to learn how to beat this guy. But in the short term, nobody knows how to beat this guy. So he very well could come out, maybe not even play that great technically, but because he's enormous and because nobody has a book on him, he might be able to exceed expectations in the very beginning. And there ain't that many games left. If, if, if a goalie steals one or two games the rest of the way, like, that could be enough to get you in the playoffs. Now... By the same token, I'm sure this has been a a dramatic change in life that Fedotov is going through. So I am not ready to just be like, yeah, throw him in because it would be fun. Would I like to see Fedotov sooner rather than later? Yeah, of course. Because I'm a writer, that's a hell of a good story. But I understand if Dillaball watches Fedotov, you know, in practice and in sessions, whatever, and is just like, yeah, this dude, if we throw him in there, like, it could be a disaster. I understand. I am not going to be, like, leading me, like, play Fedotov now, play Fedotov now. If they do, I will find it cool. But I would understand if they look at it and they say he needs another week to really get his bearings here before we toss him in the NHL. It's just like, man, Airson needs a day off. It's yeah. very obvious this dude is just worn the hell down. Yes. And maybe he just doesn't have it. Like, maybe he just isn't good enough. I think it's kind of... We need to really wait on our assessment of him until next season uh, when he knows what his role is going to be going into a season. And, mm -hmm. you know, everything that's happened this year has been kind of insane for him. So I'm not, like, out on Sam Erson. But at the very least, the dude needs some freaking time. I Like, you have someone. Let's see. It, it couldn't possibly be worse than what they've yeah. gotten lately. Uh, Charlie, I just have to ask. Now, if you are to get a heart trophy votes this year where is sean walker gonna be on your ballot because clearly he's one of the best players in the whole league well apparently he had an upper body injury today. yeah he got hurt so, tonight yeah oh no yeah so bummer. that that so that that's a bummer hopefully he's okay because uh good dude obviously was a really good player for the flyers this year it's not just walker but it certainly has played a role you know they and also the fact that at the same time they were in the process of trading walker they were losing nick sealer now sealer comes back today but that pair has been a was a really good pair for the Flyers. You know, Tortorella said, I believe it was this morning, basically said, like, you can call it our second pair, what it was, but it was kind of like we sort of had two pairs. It was like 1A and 1B, where some nights he used Walker and Sealer more in the toughest matchups than Santa on York. Some nights he used Santa on York more. But, like, it wasn't necessarily the clear, like, if you have a, a, a Roman Yossi, like, obviously whatever pair Roman Yossi is on is your top pair. Like, the Sealer Walker pairing was really good, and they lost it. And then, in addition, they had also lost Drysdale, and they also lost Risto, and they lost Sealer again. And then, because of that, you then had to run York and Sandheim into the ground, despite the fact that both are probably playing hurt. And now the whole defense. But by that same token, what I, a point I will make, and I know that the cat, that the the Blackhawks scored a lot of goals at the end of this game. Whatever, the floodgates open at the end. Really, for the most part, the defense, if we're purely talking about, like, shot and chance prevention, has yeah. stayed good. Like, I thought the third period in this one, they played poorly defensively. And I thought the third period in New York, they played poorly defensively. Other than that, I guess what? They played 12 periods this week. I think they were really good defensively in 10 of them. Now, what I think is hurting them, on defense is that they just don't have the mobility and the passing ability that they had when Drysdale, when Walker was here, when he had the good Carol Carlos over seal. They just don't have that. So it makes it tougher to transition to offense and then add in the fact that the forwards are just snake bitten at the moment. Like they're, they're missing wide open shots. They're shooting the pucks right in the goal, right in the goalies when they're staring at half an open net. Like everything is kind of compounding itself where the rush game is harder to get going because they don't have the same passing and mobility on the back end. 
and then the forwards just can't freaking buy a goal at the moment. Like, the only time they really could buy a goal was that insane, crazy third period in New York. Aside from that, they've been missing a lot of shots. They've been hitting posts. They've been shooting right into the goalie's chest. Like, this is... It's a multifaceted problem, I guess is what I'll say. But I do want to say that I think the defense, the defensemen are, generally speaking, playing good defense. So I don't want to completely bury them. But in, defensively, the team has been pretty good for the most part this week. It's the offense that's a problem. And the offense also plays in the defensemen. But that, to me, is the bigger issue, is the offense. And the goaltending, I guess. Yeah, the, the transition game seems to, like, really have dried up, whether it's teams kind of hanging a guy back or the defense just not being able to make those outlet passes. Your top two guys are banged up and tired. Walker's gone. Drysdale's hurt. Like, that That part makes sense. Um, one of the defensemen who did come back, it's Nick Sealer tonight. What would you think of him? First game since March 4th. He uh, played 19 minutes, third most on the blue line. Only defenseman who wasn't a minus tonight. What would you think of Sealer? Yeah, I thought he was okay. But that's him. Like, he's an okay defenseman. And I like Nick Sealer. He's a great mm-hmm. dude. He's not, like... I kind of talked about this, I forget, on one of the many post games we did this week. I don't even remember which one. But I mentioned, essentially, that like it's wild that we are talking about Nick Sealer's return as this like huge freaking thing for this defense. And it, on one hand, it's like props to Nick Sealer for putting himself in position where we're real excited about Nick Sealer returning. But also, Nick Sealer is not an impact defenseman. He's a perfectly fine defenseman who on a great team is probably a really good third pair guy. He's not going to come back and fix the defense on his own. Now, what I think I would like to see is I don't love this Sealer Johnson. No. I, I just bad. I don't I just don't like it in principle because the reason why the Sealer Walker pairing works so well is that like Sealer does play hard. And he's good defensively, and he throws his body around like a wolf. But he's never going to be a great passer. He's an okay skater. He's certainly not a great skater. Walker was a legitimately good passer and a legitimately really good skater. Like, he can fly. He's a legitimate plus NHL skater. Eric Johnson is basically just resorted to off the glass and out now. He knows it. Like, that's all he can do. And he can't really skate anymore. Like, he is a very slow defenseman. So what you're basically doing is you're putting Sealer with a guy who cannot even come close to replicating what Walker provided. Like, I know they scratch him, and I know he had a really rough game in Montreal, which is why I wasn't mad they scratched him, but I kind of like the idea of trying Sealer with Adder because mm. Adder can skate, Adder can pass. Now, he makes mistakes. Like, he did not play well against Montreal. That's a fact. But he can do at least some of the things that Walker could do, and maybe you could get something out of that duo. Zamul has been playing well. Jinning is playing about as well as I think he can, but he has inherent limitations. Adder, to me, out of the guys that aren't Cam York and Travis Sanheim, he has the highest ceiling. And I'm not even talking about long-term. I'm talking about short-term. Just like in terms of the impact he can have on an individual game just because of his physical attributes. I would like to see them try that duo out to see if maybe they can catch lightning in a bottle and maybe have another pairing that can actually spark a breakout and get a transition. All right, Charlie. Uh, I think that's basically it. Um, I want to mix it up tonight. And, I mean, if you want to do three stars, go ahead. I wanted to do three LOLs if you wanted to give anti-stars to people, but it's your call. Uh, Charlie O'Connor's three stars or opposite of three black holes. Charlie O'Connor, take it away. <laughs> I mean, I guess I could do like guys who I thought played especially poorly. I, I mean, I thought Diego Zamola had a rough game. You know, yes. he, he has that uh, that lost puck battle that leads to the breakaway goal. I thought he struggled, um, so he would probably be one. Arison wasn't great. Um, I don't think he was horrific, but you give up five goals to the Blackhawks. He didn't play that well. Uh, I thought that second goal, the first one, like, yeah, I guess ideally you hug the post. I honestly kind of put that on Jinning because my thing is you make the first stop on a wraparound. You should never be allowed a second poke at a wraparound. Like, the defenseman yes. should be there to knock the guy on his ass after he gets the first chance. Jinning was late. And the guy gets the second one, and he pushes it in. So I'm not going to kill Harrison for that. But the Kurashev goal, like, 
it was a good shot, but you got to freaking stop it, man. Like you have to. There's there's no screen. You know, you have the angle in theory. You could be in better position. You got to make that save. And then when the game kind of the Felino goal, I'm not going to give a shit for the Anderson. There's a breakaway. Like yeah, he's been good at breakaways in the past. Would love to have a stop there, but whatever. It's a breakaway. He wasn't great. I don't think he was terrible, but he wasn't great. So he could be one of the three. I think the third one. I don't know. Everybody was kind of <laughs> underwhelming. Like, I, I want to see more out of Katuri. I want to see more out of Faraby. I don't know if Katuri really has anything more to give. I guess I'll say Faraby because I would like to think he does have more to give, and he just isn't right now. But honestly, like, that that third one could just be the team because I don't think anybody played well tonight. It was just a rough one. All right, Charlie. Uh, I think that will do it for us tonight. Thank you for joining, and we will uh, – Talk after Monday's game, 16th game in 32 days. We're just rolling them out there, my friend. Thriving. <laughs> We're doing our best here. We're doing our All best. Right. Thanks, guys. That- we all silly like the mayor.